Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. The title is God Invites Israel into a Covenant. And let me just say that we'll work our way through this passage. Um, and then next week we're going to take some extra time. I don't know that we'll really get any further um, than chapter 19 in our next study. But I want to talk about the whole idea of covenants. So we're going to touch it a little bit today. But um, what, is the, what are the covenants? And what, what is their place? What is their function? Uh, which of them are still um, having an impact today? Which of them have become obsolete and have no more um, you know, force to them? Um, and in that, how do we relate to the law? Um, what about the Sabbath? What about the Ten Commandments? What are we to do? Are we under the law? Are we not under the law? And if we are not under the law, then are we under the Ten Commandments? And, and if we're under the Ten Commandments, then what about the Sabbath? Or are we not? I, I, these are the questions that um, I want to address. I think are really, really important for us to, to look at from, a, from the Old Testament to the New Testament point of view. Let's see what Scripture has to say. Because... Honestly, there are so many that make a mistake in this area, and they can end up shipwrecking their faith completely if they're not careful. And this uh, was brought to Rebecca and myself um, just here recently, somebody we know, and they're out there encouraging people to, uh, to keep the Sabbath. And what does it mean when you encourage people to keep the Sabbath? Is it okay to have a day of rest? And then, well, what about the Sabbath? So those are the things we're going to be talking about in our next study uh, because really from chapter uh, 19, well, chapter 19 is, is a summary of the covenant. Moving on into chapter 20, all the way through the book of Leviticus, is the covenant. It is the details of the covenant. And so I think the, often these are questions we have in mind. And, and if this is no longer enforced, then does that mean things we believe in hold to today maybe are not in force, and how do we know? And I think there's some very simple answers to, to all of this. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, today, though, we're going to dig into uh, the actual text of chapter 19. So let's go ahead and, and turn there. We're going to begin reading verses 1 through 4, and we begin with God's plan for fellowship. In the third month after the wilderness, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So Moses is told to remind Israel what God had done for them. It was an important reminder to see that he loved them, that he cared for them, that he was watching over them. Because in the next couple of verses, he's going to invite them to enter into a covenant, a legal contract, if you will, with him. And who is it that they're entering into? I mean, anytime you enter into a contract, I mean, you have the details of the contract. But what is almost as equally or maybe even more important than the details of the contract is who is the person you're entering the contract with? Because you can have it all squared away legally, but if they are not a person that's of upright character, now you just, you've relegated yourself to you know, a battle of lawyers. And so you want to be careful. So the Lord begins here in verses 1 through 4 by saying, this is who I am. This is who I am. This is what I have done for you. They are at the Mount Sinai. And um, the exact location of Mount Sinai is, is not known. And if you take some time to look in, if you have a Bible that has maps in the back, probably um, on the wilderness wandering uh, map, you'll see uh, possible sites of Mount Sinai. They're usually marked by the, the triangle like you see up on that slide in front of you. And I mean, there's a dozen possible sites that people will give. There is a traditional site, which is Jebel Musa, and there's a picture of it there. This is the traditional site of um, the, the, you know, the Mount Sinai where Moses is going to ascend and come down. If you can move on to the next slide. Um, but there, there's just there's possibilities. You can, you can research these and check these out. So the question is, is this a good thing that we know? 
Or is it a good thing that we don't know? Which is it? And, you know, there are plenty of places where we do know the geographical location. And we can say this happened right here at this spot. So it's not like um, we have to have ignorance of it all. But for whatever reasons, th this very important site has, cannot be stated with biblical certainty that this is where it is. And maybe in the thinking and the wisdom of the Lord, this was like, I know what people are going to do if they know where this site is. And people are going to mishandle this and they're going to treat this as something more, uh, more idolatrous than a place uh, to remember what God had done. But I want you to notice there in verse 4 um, that God brought Israel to himself, denoting that he has plans for fellowship and interaction. It really is an amazing statement to, to read that. It says, I brought you to myself. I didn't just bring you to a mountain. I didn't just bring you through the Red Sea. I was doing something more than all of that. The ten plagues, the Red Sea, the water, the manna, the quail. All of that was to bring you to myself. To have a relationship with me. And that is the goal. That is what this is all about. Is having a relationship with our maker, our creator. And this was true as they were getting ready to enter into the uh, covenant with them, the Mosaic covenant. Um, and the Lord is calling them in and he says, I have brought you to myself to enter into this relationship. Now we have been brought into a covenant as well. Not the Mosaic covenant, but the new covenant. The covenant that Jesus secured for us as he died on the cross, his blood was shed, his body was broken and rose from the dead. This is the new covenant that we have, the forgiveness of sins. And yet he brings us we read there that he bore them on eagle's wings, a mother uh, you know, eagle f flying underneath the eaglet as it tries out its new wings and being borne up on eagle's wings. That's the idea here. The Lord was watching over Israel as they journeyed out, but the Lord is also, he is the one that is leading us out into this salvation. He's the one that brings us to this place to have fellowship with him. So even as they would know that the Lord had taken care of them and would brought them to a good end for fellowship, this would encourage them to enter into a relationship. We find a similar exhortation in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. It says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Well, how do you respond to that? What do you mean, I'm not my own? I mean, I want to be, I want to be my own. Well, you, the Bible says if you're a Christian, you're not your own. Well, whose am I? And, uh, you know, it matters who owns you. It's a matter, it matters who has a say over your body and, and how you're to live and think. And as you think about that, who that person is, is that a good person? Is this somebody that's caring for you and watching over you? And so he says, for you are bought at a price. And we know that price was what? The blood of Jesus. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, the call to enter into a relationship with the Lord and have the sovereign God of the universe over your life is built upon the gracious uh, good works of God towards us. So there is no reason to be afraid for Israel uh, to enter into the covenant because he's been watching out for them and they have recent history to experience God's goodness through the, the 10 plagues that came upon Egypt and the Red Sea. Why would they not want to enter into a covenant with a God like that? And likewise, when we know how the, the Lord has bought us and paid for us and, and taken care of us, why would we bristle at the idea of allowing him to have complete control over our life? And we shouldn't. And if we do, it only is a testimony of the fact that we have, fought, we have failed to recognize the goodness of the Lord in our life. I don't know if I can trust him. What do you mean you don't know if you can trust him? You can't trust yourself. Him you can trust. Yeah, but I just want to be in control. You know, you're really not in control of as much as you think you're in control of. Just go, go travel somewhere. You'll figure that out real fast, you know. You're not in control of things. You're in, there's so much of your life that you are not in control of. To have the Lord over your life, it should bring security and comfort, especially if you know who he is. Do you know how good and how kind he is that he would send his only son to buy you out of the slave market of sin by him dying on the cross. 
You can't find anybody that's going to care for your soul or love your soul more than that. And so we should be able to, therefore, glorify God in our body, which are his. I trust you, Lord. I have complete confidence in you. In verses 5 and 6, the statement comes. So he says, verses 1 through 4, here I am. This is what I've done for you. Now, verses 5 and 6, I invite you into this covenant. Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So it's an invitation. I want to have a covenant with you. Well, what do we mean by covenant? And I got a definition for you put up there and leave for a moment to, for you just to look at. It's an agreement between two parties which binds them to certain commitments from one to another or to each other. Theologically, in relations between God and man, it denotes God's gracious commitment to bless man. So a covenant is always God's gracious commitment to bless man, but it's an agreement. It's a contract. Um, there are covenants that were made um, among nations, among um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, an invading nation, a greater nation over a people that was subdued. Uh, and this is that type of covenant. The greater is making a covenant with the lesser, Israel. And it's a true in all covenants. With us, it's the Lord making a covenant with us, the lesser, the, the church. But this is the Lord's. Would you enter into this agreement? They're going to say yes, and then from Exodus 20 to Leviticus, I think chapter 27 is the last chapter, you get the details. 613 different things that they were to do. Um, so they're going to get, find out what is required of them in this covenant. Now, I, I want us to just pause for a moment, because when we talk about the covenant, we're talking about the Mosaic covenant. And I think we have a Sometimes in our zeal to make certain that we are not trying to earn our way to salvation and that we're no longer under the law, we end up trashing the Mosaic Covenant, which we shouldn't do. Is the Mosaic Covenant a good thing? It's a good thing. Is it a way to be saved? Not a way to be saved. Is it a good way for a nation to live and for the laws for them to have and how to approach God? Oh, it's amazing. But it was never meant to be the way by which they would be saved. People have only and ever been saved through what? Faith. Only and ever through faith. That's how God has always worked. So this covenant was an agreement where he was going to bring certain blessings and promises to them. And then they had to also uh, obey the, the details of this covenant. So... We're no longer under the old covenant. We are no longer under the Mosaic covenant. Um, not a way to be saved, but it's not a terrible thing. And so uh, it, it's not enforced today. So we need to have a, a proper way to look at this. Because sometimes, I know for me at least, um, there came a point in my thinking, like, wait a minute, Mosaic covenant is not a bad thing. It's just not the thing that God is doing today. And so... We'll look more about at that in, in our next study. But <clears throat> make no mistake about it, God is inviting the people of Israel into something special. He's inviting them into something that would be a, a, a point of blessing uh, for them. Israel is going to have a special place in his heart. I mean, when you read covenant in, in, um, in light of being a special treasure, um, being the people above all other people, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Um, obviously, God's not saying, hey, I've got this really bad deal for you. It's called the you know, Mosaic Covenant. You want to enter in? <laughs> I mean, God doesn't look at it that way at all. I mean, this is, you're my special treasure. I, I've got this thing for you. And they are a chosen nation of God's love and kindness. He only has chosen one nation, to be the special object of his favor, and that is the nation of Israel. He's not entered into a covenant with any other nation other than the nation of Israel. Of course, the Abrahamic covenant is one that is still in force today. This one is not, but there, we'll see the Davidic covenant next week, the, the land covenant or the Palestinian covenant, others that the Lord made with the children of Israel. But he says, oh, this, is, this is my plan for you. I'm going to bless you. Um, and you're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, which is a way to say, I want you to be my representatives on earth to the rest of the world. 
I want the, the other nations to be able to look and say, oh, look at that nation and how they live and the holiness and the blessing it is, the way they keep the commandments of God that he gave to them and, and the way he prospers them and the way the unity and the peace they have in their families, in their homes, on their land, and the nation, uh, you know, uh, among the, the courts. This is to be desired, and he wanted them to reflect the glory of being in that relationship with them. But we know that's not the way things went. They repeatedly disobeyed the Lord and they broke this covenant. And in this, you know, reading that we'll do over the next months, we'll see that there were specific consequences for breaking this covenant, and they did. And so this is why we find them being exiled time and time again. Or armies coming in and bringing discipline upon them for their disobedience. So what do we make of the nation of Israel then? And, and uh, for those guys up in the uh, handling the slides, I don't want to go into the, I want to take this out of order for just a second. Put up the verse, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. And I want you to see this because it's, it reads very similarly to what we just read They're in Exodus chapter 19. And yet this is not to the nation of Israel. This is to the church. So let's read these verses here. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not attained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. So clearly it's not Israel. It's to those that didn't have a covenant, didn't have um, a relationship with the Lord. Gentiles. But what he says to them, the church is your chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation, special people. The very same language that was used in Exodus 19. So do we conclude from that, because Israel did not keep this covenant, that they forfeited that standing with the Lord, and now the church today has replaced Israel. Israel, and so there is no longer, although there might be a national uh, people, there might be an ethnic people, the Lord no longer has a covenant with the people of Israel because they broke it. And I think the Bible answers that very clearly. The answer is no, God still has a covenant. You'll be convinced of it next week, I believe. And if you're not convinced of that, then, um, you know, I don't know what to say. But God made an everlasting covenant with these people, and you will see that so clearly. But we, the church, today are the ones that are are taking up the slack, if you will. We are the ones that get to step in and to be a holy nation. Now, we're not a nation, but as a group of people, the world should be able to look at us, according to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, and say, look at that group called the church, how they live how they're a holy people, they're a set-apart people. Now, some will rail against it, but others will look and say, that's what I need in my life. You know, we're not going to reach the world by trying to become like them. The world doesn't, already knows what they're like. And for those that are looking for you know, a change in their life, they don't want something that's exactly the same. They want to see something different. So this idea that says, hey, we need to be, you know, we need to be cool and we need to you know, uh, bend the rules a bit and make... Christianity more desirable, not so. When we stand out, that's when we become a light in the midst of the darkness. That's when we become a nation of priests. We are ambassadors going into the world and calling people to be reconciled to God. This is how we function in that priesthood. We're his special people. And this is the time that we live in right now. But to answer the question, because Peter applies The words of Exodus 19 to the church, does that mean that God is done with Israel because they broke the covenant? Well, Romans 11, turn there with me, answers this question. And I'm going to read a lengthy section here. I'm going to read verses 1 through 2, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 11 through 25. The question is asked by Paul. I say then, has God cast away his people? That would be Israel. Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? And he goes on to to that section. Now move down to verse 11. I say then, 
Have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to Gentiles. Now if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh, that would be Israelites, and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, Israel, and you were being, being a wild olive tree, Gentiles, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. For just a moment, we're part of the new covenant. But the new covenant was first promised to who? The nation of Israel. We get to enter into that new covenant. And this is the idea that he's talking about. Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, Israel, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? What's that? If you can get saved, how much more Israel? It makes more sense. It's an easier process for the natural branches to be a part of salvation than it is for the wild, which is the Gentiles in the church. But here it is. It comes down to verse 29, or 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until... Oh, there's a time limit on this. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When does that happen? When the last Gentile is saved and the church is raptured, now God will begin to work in the nation of Israel again. The last seven years, known as the Great Tribulation or the 70th week, and he will work to restore them and bring them back in. At the end of the tribulation, they will call upon the Lord and all Israel that remains and confessing the Lord will be saved. So they'll know the Lord is not done with Israel. This is a covenant that they were entering into. It's a covenant they were going to break. Why do I even bring this up? Because people will seize upon 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 to say, look, God has replaced Israel with the church. But you have to contend with Romans chapter 11 that clearly says, don't be ignorant. Don't be haughty. What would be ignorant? To say God is done with Israel. What would be haughty? Is to say that it's only... The, the church that's going to be saved. And that's his whole point. God is going to do a work among them again. Let me read to you a quote. Christians are a special people because God has preserved them for himself. While these descriptions of the church are similar, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, are similar to those used of Israel in the Old Testament, this in no way indicates that the church supplants Israel and assumes the national blessings promised to Israel to be fulfilled in the millennium. Peter just used similar terms to point up, point to similar truths. As Israel was a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so too believers today are chosen, are priests, are holy, and belong to God. Similarity does not mean identity. So we have similar truths, but that does not mean we take on the identity of the nation of Israel. So I just want to get that out there because this is, this is a big point of uh, difference among many God-fearing, Christ-loving believers. Some believe God is done with Israel. Others, like myself, we do not. So a covenant. Here you go. 
And um, although they're going to break this covenant, and although this covenant is going to come to its end, um, the Abrahamic covenant, that's still in force. Um, the Davidic covenant, that's still in force. The Palestinian the land covenant, that's still in force. And I realize for some of you, are like, I don't know what those are. That's why you need to be back here next week. So a little advertisement for that. Let's move on. In verses 7 through 25, Israel prepares to meet God. So they're going to say, a covenant with you who bore us up on eagles' wings, who has delivered us? Of course we will. Verse 7. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord had commanded them. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. So the Lord is setting up his spokesman, Moses, so they will never doubt his word when he speaks to them. And we will see they're going to doubt him. Verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. From the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. They had experienced the ten plagues and the deliverance. They had experienced the Red Sea. They had experienced the manna. They had experienced the water from the the rock and the quail. But this was going to be altogether different. Radically different. They were going to experience the presence of God and his voice in a way no people had ever experienced it. Moses had. And they were going to be able to have a taste of what he was experiencing with the Lord. That they might always obey the word which he delivered to them. And so it's going to be an awesome scene. But he first says, tell the people to consecrate themselves. Consecration means making holy, um, making acceptable to be close to God. So they had to be made ready to come into the presence of the Lord. And what he calls them to do is to, is to have no sexual relations. We'll read this in just a moment with their wives. But also that they should wash their clothes. Clothes takes on a spirit. It's a, it's a metaphor that speaks of salvation throughout Scripture. Being made holy, being made righteous. And so they're to wash their clothes. But I want you to think about this for a moment. You're out in the wilderness. You've been running low on water. And two million people have to wash their clothes all at the same time. I mean, you're, you know, most of us get laundry, you know, in our home or an apartment, a condo where we live. Or at least there's, you know, a, a laundromat close by that we can go to. Very convenient. And, of course, you know, they don't wash their clothes as often as we wash our clothes. So they've got to do this. And, and, and how are they going to do that? Well, remember, God had struck the rock, and out of that flinty rock came a flow of water that was enough to feed all of them, or quench the thirst of all of them and their animals. This is a major water source for them out in the wilderness now. And he says, I want you to put on clean clothes. But apart from the water supply... They could not put on clean clothes. And in a similar manner, the Lord calls us to put on garments of righteousness, but we cannot be righteous apart from the work of Jesus Christ, right? And who was that rock, by the way, in the wilderness? It was Jesus. We talked about that the last two studies, how Paul in Corinthians says, Jesus was that rock that was struck. And as he was struck there on the cross, He was able to provide for us salvation and garments of salvation. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Hey, being holy is a big deal in following God and seeking after the Lord. Now, they are going to enter into a covenant where they've got to be obedient, and they're going to have uh, sacrifices they can make when they sin. But they are going to ultimately wait for the final sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But for us, we look to Jesus. We cannot be made righteous on our own. But once we're made righteous, once we have entered into that relationship with the Lord, and we have been forgiven of our sins, we've been justified, we still must walk a holy life. And this this passage here in Hebrews, it speaks of the need to be holy. 
And you know what happens? That as a saved person, saved by the grace of God, do you know what happens as a saved person when I stop walking in holiness? When I allow my attitude or my lust or my greed, my covetousness, when I allow my self-indulgence and whatever kind of you know, pursuit, do you know what happens in my relationship with the Lord? It gets really hard to see him. It gets very difficult to see him. I want you to think back to when you first got saved and when you were seeking after the Lord so hard and you were controlling your thoughts and your speech and your attitude and your, your heart towards other people, the way you were serving him. How, what was it like when you sang that worship song? You could see him so quickly in those lyrics and it just touched your heart so deeply. What was it like when you read the scriptures? How did it touch you? How did it minister to you? And yet when we allow a little bit of sin to begin to creep in, I'm not saying you lose your salvation, but what I am saying is your vision of the Lord becomes clouded. And it, even that walk that you used to take out into the mountains or wherever you would go, and as you would go, man, you would just would commune with the Lord and you would see that creation and his invisible attributes would be so clearly seen to you and you begin to glorify him. And now, because of the sin that's in your life, you don't even see that walk out in the mountains that your maker, your creator made, you don't even see that the same way. You, 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 it all begins to be blurred and your intimacy with the Lord begins to be different. Don't think that's what he wants and don't think that that's normal and don't think that that's right and don't think that that's acceptable. We've been called to consecrate ourselves and of course, initially we are consecrated as believers through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, but then we continue to come to him and confess our sins and let him know, repent of those things. We maintain the relationship with the Lord. 1 John 2.28 talks about a meeting we're going to have with the Lord where we're going to want to be consecrated just like they needed to be consecrated on this meeting on the mountain. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. When the Lord returns... If we are found abiding, that is, being consecrated, obeying his word, then we're, we're not going to be ashamed. We're going we're to rejoice at his appearing. But if you are not obeying the Lord, you're not abiding in the Lord, that is going to be a shameful appearing. You're going to feel ashamed at his appearing. You're going to be like, oh no, Lord. I know all that you've done for me. I know all that you have cleansed me of. I know all the amazing things you've done in my life and here I am caught up in this junk. This maybe it'll be outright sin or maybe it'll just be caught up with stuff that just is meaningless. It doesn't hold any value in the weight of it and in the light of eternity. So they were to consecrate themselves. Jesus is going to, they're going to get consecrated as they wash their clothes in that water and they're going to receive those those uh, clean garments in a similar way. In Christ, we receive those garments. Revelation 3.18, Jesus is speaking. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. You know, we put on the garments of salvation when we come to Christ. And it covers the, our nakedness. It covers our sin, our shame. And so garments, white garments in Scripture become that metaphor of the righteous acts of the saints, of being made clean. And that you find this here in uh, Exodus 19, and you find it running all the way through into that passage I just referred to in many other places in the book of Revelation of the white garments. You are, you are made righteous in Christ Jesus. You, look how righteous? The righteousness of who? of God in Christ Jesus. Not in yourself. The righteousness of God comes to you as you are in Christ Jesus. And you put on these garments, these you know, metaphorical garments that makes you clean before the Lord. I just love the parallel, the imagery that we find even in the institution of the Old Covenant and how it is completely fulfilled in the New Covenant in Christ. Look at verse 12. He says, you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall be, surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him. 
but he shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. They are learning that God is inviting them into something that they had never experienced before. They're invited into a, uh, the presence of God. No other group of people had ever experienced this. They would be the first congregation. You have individuals that encountered God, but they're going to be the first congregation of people to ever corporately experience the presence of God in this amazing, magnificent way. It is a wide open door, however, only come this far. You must stop at the bound, these boundaries. And if you go beyond that and you sin against me and you disregard me, there will be severe consequences. And I realize that people will look at this today and many will bristle that God would require them to stop at the boundary. Well, who is he to say that you can only go? So I believe that you, they could go on as far as they wanted to go. But you see, this is a problem with modern man is that modern man has made himself God and has made God subservient to his own ideas, his own whims, his own will, his own desires. Then your commandments, that is what God must submit to. God must allow me to live my life the way I want to, according to my indulgences and according to my desires, according to what feels right to me, and God must be okay with it. No, he doesn't have to feel okay with it, and he doesn't feel okay with it. You can try and twist it and turn it upside down, and you can even bristle at the idea that God would place limitations on how you can live your life, but it does not change that the boundaries still exist. They're there. And God has told us how to live and that we can't just go and live however we want to. The Spirit of God dwells within us and he calls us to holiness. He calls us to live a righteous life. We'll talk about this next week. The, the, the Ten Commandments, the 613 Commandments, and the impact they had upon a person's heart and mind is nothing compared to the weight of having the finger of God right upon your fleshly heart how to live your life. You know, with the law, you could, you could obey the commandment, and yet your heart could be a million miles away. But what does the Lord say? He wants us not just to not murder people. He wants us to love people. He wants us to not just don't commit adultery, don't lust in your heart. And so the, 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 the written law of God upon your, your heart at, the, at your conversion goes far more than any set of rules that even God established. So there are those limitations that the Lord placed. He says, don't go beyond this point. It was an awesome scene. In verses 14 through 25, we once again see the Lord sternly tells Moses to warn the people about drawing close. And I want to pick it up partway down. I'm going to let you kind of uh, read through this, but you just see at verse 18, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because a Lord descended upon it in fire. Some will say this is a volcano. No, it says because the Lord came. It's not a volcano with an earthquake happening. It says the reason why there is smoke on this mountain, and it is because the Lord has descended. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. It doesn't say it was the smoke of a furnace, but it was like that. And a whole mountain quaked greatly. And the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder. Now here's the thing. No human is blowing this trumpet. As God himself is making this sound. And it's getting louder and louder. And the smoke is there. And the fire is there. And it's quaking. And Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also the priests who come near uh, the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up. To, the Mount, to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Away, get down and then come up, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. So Moses could go up. On invitation, 
Aaron could come up, but the people couldn't. They could only come so near to the Lord. Their, their experience of the Lord was limited. But you want to know what? That's under the old covenant. That's under the Mosaic covenant. Under the new covenant that Jesus has purchased for us with his body and his blood, there is no limitation to how close you can come to Jesus. I mean, as you read this, I, I can't help but read this and think, man, I would have wanted to be Moses. I would want to be Moses that's going up on the mountain and interacting with the Lord and seeing him and hearing his voice. I wouldn't want to have been one of the guys that couldn't come. I think all of us probably feel that. I would have wanted that experience. But I guess only some get that experience and some don't. Under the old covenant, that's true. Under the old covenant, and the temple, and by the way, the temple was constructed and made off of the blueprints of the one that is in heaven. So there is a temple in heaven. And then Moses was given the, the blueprint and they made it on earth. And that one on earth, in the holy place, had two compartments to it. There's a holy place and the most holy place. And the holy place, there's the table of showbread, there was a candelabra, and people would come in, the priests, excuse me, would come in and they would set the table, they would get the table replaced out with bread, they would keep the altar of incense in the coals burning, they would bring in, you know, fresh oil for the lamps, and they would maintain that. And they, all day long, there would be a maintaining of that holy place. But then there was the most holy place that was beyond that and was separated with a veil that many estimate to be about 18 inches thick. And in that section of the, the temple, there was the Ark of, of the Covenant, and inside was the Ten Commandments, a jar of manna, and Aaron's rod that had budded. And then they placed the lid, the mercy seat. is not really a seat. It's not a chair. It's a lid that went over that box, the Ark of the Covenant, and that's where the angel's wings were spread out. Once a year, only one man, the high priest, could come into that room. And it was on the Day of Atonement, and he must come with blood, and he would bring the blood on behalf of the nation, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat over which Israel had broke the commandments. See the picture? The commandments are there. It's broken. The blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. And so they would atone for the, the, the sins. But only one man could do that. So even as you see a limitation here around the mountain with Moses and Aaron, there was a limitation in everyday life in Israel. And only one man could go in once a year on that prescribed day. But what about for you? What about for Troy? How close can you come to the Lord and how often can you come? We'll close by reading this passage here. It's Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23. Picture the temple. Picture that 18-inch veil that was woven saying, Keep out only one man once a year. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, Never experienced this before. Which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with what? Pure water. Let us hold the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. When Jesus hung and died on the cross, we read in the Gospels, that when he died, that the veil in the temple, the physical temple on earth, was ripped from top to bottom. But you know, I firmly believe that the veil in the temple that's in heaven was ripped from top to bottom as well. And what did that mean? What it, the Lord was saying is, the way is open. There are no more boundaries. There's no more veils. There's no more only one man can come so close and all the rest of you have got to stay away. The Lord was saying, come. And that's actually what he says in Hebrews. Draw near with a full heart of assurance. Boldly enter into the holiest place, the most holy place. And as we come today, we don't go to this physical place. But every time we draw near in fellowship with the Lord, where are we going? In the heavenlies, you're going into that temple. 
And you're walking into the holy place and there's the showbread and there's the altar of incense. And then you walk straight into the most holy place that previously was only for one person. And you and I and every believer through the blood of Jesus Christ, because his body, the veil was ripped, can now come and have as intimate fellowship with God as we choose to. Not want to. I want to be more intimate with the Lord than I am. I think probably all of us would say that. I would love to be closer to Jesus than I am. But I am as close with Jesus as I have, what? Chosen to be. And the same is true for you. And, and this, there's no hierarchy. It's no Moses, Aaron, priesthood. You know, you're, you're, the, you're the priesthood. This is what we just said. You're a holy nation. How, how intimate do you want to be with Jesus? How well do you want to know him? Then choose that. We all want greater intimacy, but we have to choose that. And it works that way even in this world. Is, does anybody else ever feel like overwhelmed and not having enough time to spend with other people? Is that anybody or is that just a pastor? Okay, a few of you. Well, yeah, if you want to ever know how I feel guilty, that's where I feel guilty like almost every day of my life. Like, oh, I didn't get to those people. I didn't get to talk to them. We got to spend more time with this. Rebecca, like, you know, we really have to have them over. I'm like, oh, I know, I know, I know. And it's so hard to try and develop those relationships because life is just busy. But here's the one relationship we cannot be too busy about. And that's a relationship with Jesus. How close do you want to beat him? How well do you want to know his voice? How, how full of the Spirit do you want to be? Draw near to the Lord. Well, if he wants me to have it, he can give it to me. If he wants me to be intimate, he'll just draw me in. No, he won't. You, he's already called you into the new covenant. But you've got to now, as you read here in Hebrews, you've got to decide, I'm going in. I'm going in with the Lord. What are the things that keep us away? Junk. It's not, nothing that's that important. Even the most important thing you can name does not hold a candle to the glory of meeting with the Lord. Let's meet with the Lord. Draw near. Yeah, but my life is so messed up. Oh, but you've been washed clean. Your, your conscience has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. And he has forgiven you. You have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not you will have. You have it if you put your faith in the Lord. You've got the garments on. You're dressed right because of what Jesus. Now come in and don't be condemned any longer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, we ask that you administer to our hearts from this passage the great potential that lies in front of us. Well, for Israel, what great potential they had. But what we have is greater. They had something that nobody had ever had before, but the day came when we received that something that nobody had ever had before. Lord, help us to draw near and to meet with you. You are a good God. You have taken care of us. You have borne us up on eagle's wings. And Lord, you are worthy. Lord, you are of such great worth. Forgive us for allowing things, phones, sports, just busyness of this life, the cares of this world to keep us from meeting with you. They, Lord, we just say it. They're, they're not as important. We know they're not. But we just pray that you would overwhelm us today with your love and your grace at the invitation to draw near to you, that we would come, that we would come to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.